Remain standing with me. They'll put the scripture on the screen. The last bit, we have been in a series of messages on the power of vision. And I do plan, Lord willing, to come back and revisit that again about the power of vision. But this morning, with the Lord's help, I just want to preach the gospel. And I want to share some things about the mystery of Easter. The mystery of Easter. If you'll look with me either in your Bible or on the screens, 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 51. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible has put on incorruption, and this mortal has put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your sting? O Hades, where is your victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Take me back to verse 51, please. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. The mystery of Easter. God, I just have this real sense in this moment that you're here with us. I thank you, God, that you are not far removed. The universe is not just a cosmic clock that you wound up and let run and then turned away from it. God, you don't operate that way. You care. You know where we are and you care. In fact, the Word says that you have the very hairs on our heads numbered, that you care about us so much. And most of all, you sent your Son. And Lord, I pray for life change today. I pray for you to do your work one life at a time. God, I can't do this, but you can. And I pray for your anointing. Lord, you're anointing. It doesn't matter how impossible the situation appears to be. The anointing of your Spirit breaks every chain. The anointing of your Spirit changes things. God, I pray that you touch people today and do the work that only you can do and change lives. I depend on you. I rest in you for your touch and your enablement, your anointing today. In Jesus' name. And God's people said, Amen. Bless somebody as you're being seated this morning. The mystery of Easter. God is infinite. He is above us and beyond us. That's what makes him God. Sometimes we get mad and say, well, God, I don't understand why you did this or why you didn't do this. Well, if I could figure him out, he wouldn't be God. I need a God who is beyond me. Because if he doesn't have any more understanding than I do, we're all in trouble. In fact, the Bible says that his ways are above our ways and his thoughts are above our thoughts. And in fact, there are some times that God tries to, even if he did try to explain things to us, we couldn't understand it. Some things would be like you standing over an ant and trying to explain what's going on in the world to an ant. Only infinitely more so. Because we don't always understand it all. And even in faith, and, and there are truths that he gives us 
that we can base and bank our lives on. But how many of you know even serving God in this, this thing we call faith, there's a mystery sometimes. We don't always, and we don't always, we're not always able to figure everything out. And we don't like that. We wrestle with that. You know, sometimes we want to serve God as long as it makes sense to us. But sometimes there is a mystery. There, and, and, and we, but the, the, the flip side of that is even if we don't understand it all, God is good and we can trust Him. And so there is going to be a point in which there is an element of mystery that God is God and He doesn't have to explain everything to me and I wouldn't understand it all even if He did. But I can trust Him with it. And there is a mystery to Easter. Now they're going to put a couple of definitions on the screen. Here's a very secular definition of mystery. A mystery is anything that is kept secret or remains unexplained or unknown. Anything kept secret or that remains unexplained or unknown. I don't know if you do, but I love a good mystery. I like to watch them on TV. You know, but sometimes there are mysteries in life that we wrestle with and yet we can trust God and He's in control because here's a definition of mystery as it relates to Scripture and God's dealing with us. A mystery is that which being outside the range of unassisted natural apprehension can be made known only by divine revelation and is made known in a manner and at a time appointed by God and to those only who are illumined by His Spirit. In other words, I cannot reason my way up to God. God had to come down to me. That's why Jesus became a man. We, we can't figure God out by rational thinking because He is above and beyond us. And so there are mysteries that we trust in the heart and the mind of God. And there's a mystery to Easter. There are details in the way God did things. In sending His Son, giving His life. There, there, there is a mystery in the Easter story that only finds an explanation in Jesus Christ. It only makes sense when you understand what Jesus accomplished for us. Now if there is one theme to the Bible, you know what the theme of the Bible is? The theme of the Bible is Jesus. He is, it's all about Jesus. It has been said that the Old Testament is Jesus concealed and the New Testament is Jesus revealed. In other words, Jesus, everything you see in the Old Testament, he fulfills in the New. That there is a scarlet cord from the book of Genesis to the book of Revelation. It's all about Jesus. And when you look at this story, there are some things that only make sense when you understand that Jesus is the fulfillment of it all. Are you with me? Amen. Now let me give you two or three examples. One of the details that is of the, the crucifixion and the resurrection, one of the details that is familiar to us is this, this part about the crown where they take Jesus. Now the Bible said that Jesus was the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. In other words, from the very beginning, Nothing surprised God. God knew man was going to fail, but it was already in his heart and mind from before the foundation of the world to give his son, his only begotten son. Before you ever drew a breath, it was already planned in the heart and mind of God. But now the Bible said that as they're taking him and they, they beat him mercilessly, but the Bible said that they place a crown of thorns upon his head. A crown of thorns. Now when you think about the practicality of that, you put this thorn, you shove it down on someone's head and not only are you going to bleed, but your head's going to begin to swell. And so there's suffering as he pays this price for sin, but why, why was that necessary? Why this whole deal about thorns is it just seems as though they're adding insult to injury and he's going to be placed on a cross and why are the thorns necessary? And there's a mystery in that and why was it necessary to do I want to tell you he suffered so you and I wouldn't have to. 
But they placed this crown of thorns upon him. Well, what's, what's the deal with that? Well, when you go all the way back, and some of these things, Jesus fulfilled all of these details from the very beginning of, uh, of time, from the very beginning of creation. The Bible says when you go all the way back to Genesis 3.18, God had placed man and woman in the garden, and they sinned. We know the story. They sinned, and they fell. And all of us are born into sin. And the Bible said that when man sinned and the curse came upon the earth, do you know why the world's in such a mess? Well, why would God let this? It's not God's fault. It's because of sin. It's because man sinned. And part of the curse was, God said in Genesis 3.18, because man sinned and a curse came upon the earth, that there would be toil in his labor. And man would work, and he would work hard, and work by the sweat of his brow. And that even when we worked hard, that still the earth wouldn't yield anything easily. That's what sin brought. Nothing would come easy anymore. And he said, and I don't know if you've ever caught this, but as a direct result of the curse of sin upon the earth, he said the earth, as we tilled the ground, the earth wouldn't just give, give fruit but the earth would give thorns. And that's a symbol, that the earth would give thorns. That in other, is anybody hearing me? That in other words, from then on, because of sin, the earth wouldn't just give fruit. Nothing would come easy. The earth would give thorns, and there would be things in life that would pierce us. There would be things in life that would wound us. There would be things in life that would hurt us and cause us pain. Are you hearing me? He said that would be the nature of the human condition. That from that point on, man is few days and full of trouble. And that from then on, our lives would be characterized not just by fruit, but by thorns. By things that caused us pain. There are thorns. There are people in this room this morning who have felt the thorns. We feel the thorns. We felt the thorns. You felt the thorns of divorce. We felt the thorns of, of sickness. We felt the thorns of disappointment. We felt the thorns of hatred and bigotry and rejection and, and bitterness and setbacks and all kinds of stuff that go with this life. We would feel the thorns. And he said in Genesis 3.18, from the very beginning, because of sin, thorns would come. But when you get to the New Testament, we have a Savior that wore a crown of thorns because a crown is the symbol of kingship. And he said, I'm going to take your thorns, the things that have caused you pain, and I'm going to become the king of your pain and the king of your hurt and the king of your woundedness and the king of your misery, and I'm going to turn it around. Somebody praise him. And it only makes sense when you understand that. Yeah, we all go th- we all have some thorns and we all go through some things and we've all been wounded and pierced and felt the pain. But Jesus, because of what he did on the cross, Jesus became the king of the things that caused my greatest pain. And he redeems them and he turns them around. And I want to tell you this morning, God's not ignorant of the thorns you felt. God's not ignorant of the pain you've suffered, but he's the king of it. If you'll let him be, and he'll redeem it, and he'll turn it around, and he'll use it for his purpose. Now, you see that with the thorns, but let me give you another one. You remember this part of the story where, and it's all recorded in Matthew 27. They place this crown of thorns upon him, but when they stand him before the people, Before Pilate, before the people, it's not just Jesus, but there are two men. There are two men. You got Jesus and you got Barabbas. And so they stand, both of them up there. Barabbas was a scoundrel. Now what was that about? Why was it necessary to stand two men up there? Now Jesus was the son of God. Barabbas, the name Barabbas means the son of the father. And so you have two men 
you have two men standing up there. Now, it all goes back. Jennifer, help me, please. I've got a couple more guests here today who have never been to Parkway before, ever. And here they come. So come up here with me, guys. Tate and Macy are helping me out this morning. Just stand up here. Give Tate and Macy a good hand for helping me out. Just stand right up here. In fact, guys, let's come up here so we can see good. Now, this whole deal, this whole deal with Jesus and Barabbas, it goes back under Old Testament law, and you will find this in Leviticus 16. The Bible said on the Day of Atonement, when the high priest would come, Leviticus 16, and how many of you know all of that Old Testament stuff, Jesus didn't come to abolish the law but to fulfill it. And so why have you got Jesus and Barabbas? Because in the Old Testament, on the Day of Atonement, the high priest would come out and they took two goats. Now, tell me the names again. This is Stuart and Sweetie. Stuart, and this is Sweetie. Stuart and Sweetie. So the, the high priest would take two goats, and they would cast lots. Now, one goat, they don't bite, do they? No. <laughs> Just being sure. They take two goats and they cast lots. Now, one goat, and this is, in fact, this practice is where we get the word scapegoat from. And they would take these two goats and they'd cast lots. And, and if Stuart here, now, let's, let's declare that if that's the way the lots fall, that Stuart is the guilty goat. He's the one that all the sins of the people fall on. That symbolically the sins of Israel, aren't you glad all this was fulfilled in Jesus? And he did it once and for all, but all the sins of the people would fall on Stuart. He's the guilty goat. The other goat is innocent, but this goat, sweetie here, would be sacrificed to the Lord. Even though this goat's innocent. This goat's innocent. The guilty one is set free and the innocent one is sacrificed. And that's why when you come to the crucifixion, you've got two standing up there. There's Barabbas and there's Jesus. And Barabbas, you name it, he's done it. He's as guilty as he can be. But they let Barabbas go. His name means son of the father. We're sons of the father. We're guilty, but they let him go. But they take sweetie. They take Jesus. They take the sacrifice, the innocent one. And he sacrificed it. And one sacrificed so that the other might go free. And you see it, and they've done that for centuries. They've done that for centuries. Every year, the high priest, they sacrifice one, and they let the other go free. That's why we're called, this is not just religious exercise. It's not just going through the motions because we're nice people. We clean up for a couple of hours on Sunday morning. We're talking about life and death here. That's the reason, part of the reason we live our lives as living sacrifices to Jesus out of gratitude because we know we deserve to die, but he let us go free. And so even then, there's meaning behind all of this. And it's a mystery to us, but there's a reason. 
The first one, the thorns, that was from the very beginning of creation. And then you've got hundreds of years where they take two goats every year and one sacrificed and the other goes free. And then you've got Jesus and Barabbas. And Barabbas, so to speak, is guilty as sin. But they let him go free. And Jesus, the spotless lamb, gives his life. We're the guilty one. He's the innocent one, but he takes our place. If that doesn't do something for you, my dad used to say, if they don't light your fire, honey, your wood's wet. I mean, you got a problem. There's something wrong. I was the guilty one, but I got to go free. Thank you, guys. Give them another good hand. See, there's a mystery, and it all means something, and we pass by this stuff, and a lot of times we don't even realize it. Let me give you another one. Did you know we act like it's just a fairy tale, but it's life and death stuff. Did you know that even in the placement of the blood that there's meaning There's a mystery to all of that, that God is trying to tell us something. Now, when you go back to the Old Testament, to the Passover, when Israel came out of Egypt and was delivered from hundreds of years of bondage, they celebrated the Passover. In the Old Testament, which meant they passed over from death to life. And in the Old Testament, they had the Passover, And in the New Testament, we have the Lord's Supper, communion. We observed it last Sunday, headed into Easter. And those two tie together. Now, when they had the Passover, and they would apply the blood, are you with me? They went, everyone, to the doorpost of their house, the entryway to their house. How many of you know you need the blood over your house? And so they would apply the, door, the, the blood to the doorpost of the house. And the blood was applied in three places. On the top beam, on the right, and on the left. And so they would apply the blood on the top and on each doorpost. And if you connect the dots, how many of you know in our lives, if it's going to make sense, you've got to connect the dots a little bit. And so if you connect the dots, it becomes this triangle and it points, the Old Testament, the Passover, this triangle points from man to God as we cry out to him because he's the only one can help us to redeem us from our sin. And so under the Passover, you've got the blood applied in three places. Now when you get to the fulfillment of that, And Jesus on the cross, the blood again is applied in three places. Because they pierce his hands and they pierce his feet. And so again, in fulfillment, you have the blood applied in three places. Now, in the Old Testament, it was a cry from God to man. But in the New Testament, it comes the other way because you couldn't do it yourself. It had to come from God to man. And so it comes down this way. And when you superimpose it, it becomes the star of David, the symbol of God's people and the fulfillment of God's plan across the ages that that the blood was applied. It wasn't by accident. God knew what he was doing. It's a plan over the ages, over the centuries that's so much bigger than anything we can grasp that he's been working for you and me sitting here this morning. 
And so in the Old Testament, you had the blood applied in three places. And in the New Testament, you had the blood applied in three places. And you put it all together and it becomes the people of God and the fulfillment of God's plan through the ages. That you and I might be redeemed. See, you have to understand, we've almost allowed the world to make us feel like we got to apologize for the gospel. That somehow we're just about judgment and God's waiting to get you and we've all sinned and you're going to hell and it's turn or burn, baby, and We've just allowed the world to turn it into wrath and something it's not. I'm here to tell you all that's true, but it's not just about wrath and judgment. This is a redemptive message. He came to buy us back. (laughs) And the blood was applied. Now let me give you, let me give you another one. This is what I've been building to. I'm talking about the mystery of Easter. Now, when Jews to this day, when Jews come to Passover, when Jews come to Passover, there is a symbolism. The the gospel is portrayed in all of this. And they've been doing this for centuries. But when the Passover comes, and in each home they observe the Passover, they take the bread, which is called the matzah. They take the bread, the matzah, and they really never knew why. We know why, because we have the full revelation but they t- in the gospel. But they take the bread. Jennifer, come here and help me a second, please. They take the bread, and they really don't know why, but they take three, three pieces of bread. Are y'all reading the symbolism here with me as we walk along? They take three pieces of bread. Yeah, thank you. That's great. And you got, they don't know why, but you got God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And they take, lay them back down here a second. Thank you. They take the three pieces of bread, the matzah, and they lift it up to God. And they pray. And then they take the middle piece, the second person of the Trinity, God the Son. They take the middle piece and they break it in two pieces. Now this is Passover, but in communion, what did we say last Sunday? The fruit of the vine, that's his blood. But the bread, that's his body, which was broken. They t- he was broken for you and me. They take, his, they take the middle piece of bread and they break it, okay, because his body was broken. And then they take that piece of bread and they wrap it. They wrap it in a cloth because his You can't make this stuff up. They wrap it in a cloth because they took Jesus and before they put him in a tomb, they wrapped his body. They wrapped his body in a burial shroud, something we still perhaps have it in the shroud of Turin. We don't know for sure, but they took his body and they wrapped it. And then something, then this gets real interesting. Then the father of the house takes the bread, the matzah, and he hides it. He hides it somewhere in the house. This is Passover. Jews still do this. I don't claim to be an expert, but you understand the symbolism of what I'm saying. The father takes it and he hides it somewhere in the house. And then it becomes a game. For the children, we're supposed to teach our children. And so he hides it somewhere in the house and it becomes a game for the children. 
And they go searching through the house to find the bread. You know why? Because there's a mystery. All of a sudden, in the middle of this, the bread has disappeared. All of a sudden, in the middle of this, the bread has disappeared. And they don't know where the bread, they don't know where the body, I mean, they don't know where the bread is. They took him. They crucified him. They put him in a tomb, but all of a sudden he was gone. There was a disappearance. There was a mystery, and they didn't, nobody knew where he was. There's a mystery. They went looking. Nobody knew where he was. This week I was at Holy Week, one of the Holy Week services in our city. God made a comment that stuck with me. He said, you know, because I know they act like it's all the same, but that would make Jesus a liar because Jesus didn't say it was the same. All religions were the same. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. You say, well, they're Buddhists, they're Islamic. Maybe they're sincere. Yeah, they're sincerely wrong. You got to know Jesus. But a guy said this week, he said, Christianity is the only faith that has Easter because we're the only ones who need it. So the father takes the bread and he hides it. And there's a mystery and they don't know where it is. And they came to find Jesus and they didn't know where he was. And there was a mystery. Now we know because the Bible said he ascended back to the right hand of the Father. And his present ministry is that he ever lives to make intercession for you and me. He's praying for you. What's Jesus doing right now? He's praying for you, baby. He's praying for you. That's what he's doing. But the Father will take the bread and he'll hide it. and It's a mystery and nobody knows where it is. And so it becomes a game and the children search through the house. And when they finally find the bread, they eat of it. And they partake of it. Because it was provided for them. And I want to tell you this morning, there was a mystery. 2,000 years ago, they put him in a tomb. But all of a sudden, he wasn't there. He was gone and nobody knew where he was. And I want to tell you something. It's up to you and it's up to me to go find him. To go search and go look for him until you find bread that you can eat of that will satisfy the longing of your soul. Because he is the bread of life that satisfies when nothing else will. And some of you in this room have lived your life, too much of your life as a mystery. It's not made sense. And you didn't have the answers. And you didn't know where to go look. Some of you went to drugs and alcohol and sex and money and pride and achievement and all kinds of things. But you know what? you got to find the bread before you'll be able to solve the mystery of your life. Before it will make sense. Because without Him, none of it has any meaning. It's all about Him. It only makes sense when we come to Jesus. And that is the mystery of Easter. Paul said, Behold, I show you a mystery. And he went on to talk about the resurrection. And it all goes back to Easter because there's a mystery in Easter. We celebrate Christmas, thank God for it. But this is where we find completion, this is where the mystery is solved. 
This is where we find meaning because Jesus is alive. <clears throat> and you have to come and you have to partake of him. Eat of his flesh, drink of his blood. It only makes sense when I come to him. Why am I looking and it doesn't seem like I can find any answers no matter how hard I try, no matter where I go. Because you've not come and found the bread. And the Bible says there's a wonderful promise that I've come to love. And I've heard it all my life, but in the last few years especially, we just dealt with a lot of people in a lot of different situations. And it's become more real to me. Even though I'd read it all my life, it's become more real to me than it ever was in all my life. When he gives this incredible promise repeatedly in Scripture, and he says, If you search for me, you will find me. If you search with all your heart. Because you can't be casual about it. Proverbs, you know a lot of people have just enough of God to make them miserable. Proverbs 22 and 5 said it's the glory of God to conceal a matter and it's the glory of kings to search it out. you got to search. If you're going to really find God, you got to search. But you know when you were a kid and, or maybe when you had kids, you play hide and seek and you let them go for a while and they can't find you, so you grunt or make a noise. You know what I'm talking about. Because you may be hiding, but you want them to find you. Some of you have not always understood the workings of God in your life. I'm going to tell you something. You had to go search, but the good news is He wanted you to find Him. He wanted you to find Him. More than anything, he wanted you to find him. And he says, come. Come. Take and eat. I don't care. I don't care what your issue is. I don't care how far you've gone or gotten away. I don't care what kind of hole you're in. You'll find what's been missing. 